Good morning. We're indeed grateful for your presence here with us today to worship together in spirit and in truth our Father which is in heaven. Hope, trust, and pray that everything we've said and everything we've done to this point has been encouraging and uplifting to your spirit. And now as we set forth to study a portion of God's Word, I wish to challenge your thinking today. Last week, Mute. there we go. <laughs> you sure know how to kill a sermon, don't you? I do. <laughs> Last week we began looking at uh, a lesson entitled The Challenge of Holiness. And I hope that you can clearly see that living a holy life certainly is a challenge. You have witnessed that in your life as a child of God. However, we did not finish that lesson last week. You may have thought that was a completed lesson, and in some ways it was, but uh, today I want us to consider that text again, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, and then chapter 7 and verse 1. In looking at that lesson last week, we learned very quickly, number one, that God desires His children to be holy. In 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 14, we find out that He calls us to be holy because He is holy. And so essentially He says, if I'm going to have my people, they will be holy. Today, as I said, we want to finish that lesson specifically looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. If you haven't opened your Bibles there, please do so. As you're turning there, let me give you a brief summation of what we studied last week. Number one, we talked about the call to holiness. And we saw that that calling to holiness is something that, it didn't originate with us, it's something that God has done. He called each one of us through His Gospel, 2 Thessalonians 2.14, to live this holy life. And so it's a challenge issued by God Himself. Secondly, last week, we considered the consolation of holiness. The fact that yes, in living this holy life, we do or we should give up certain things. We no longer talk the way we used to talk. Perhaps we shouldn't have the friends that we used to have. Maybe we don't dress the way we used to or perhaps just quitting some things. But even when you do that, it's important to recognize the consolation that we have, that great reward that we have for doing it. We concluded last week by considering the completion of holiness. And we saw that number one, there is a time side to that, that each and every day that I'm living my life, I ought to be getting more holy, if you will. I ought to be sinning less today than I did a year ago or last week. And then we looked at the eternity side of that, the fact that when Jesus splits the skies asunder to deliver the kingdom to the Father, that ultimately our body will be changed, Philippians chapter 4, verse 21, and that we'll be made like Him. That is the completion of holiness. Today, however, I want us to consider another point from 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. As we talk about this idea, it's going to be a sermon in and of itself. And today, I want us to consider the fact that there is a cleansing involved in our holiness. Yes, there's a call to holiness. Yes, there are some consolations to our holiness. And yes, our holiness will be complete one day. But there is a cleansing involved there. This is the thing that I believe we really need to focus on. This is also the thing that I, I personally believe is probably the most difficult considering our challenge to holiness. And it all hinges on that statement you see highlighted in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1. Let's read it together. Therefore, having these promises beloved, watch this, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Completing holiness in the fear of God. You notice we didn't comment on that much last week, did we? And that was by design. We want to talk all today about this cleansing. And so you might ask yourself the question then, how is it that I can do what Paul says there in 2 Corinthians 7.1? How can I cleanse? 
cleanse myself from that filthiness of the flesh and spirit. But more importantly, what is it that cleanses us? You say, well, preacher, I've been in the church long enough to know that the blood of Jesus is what cleanses my sin. And you'd be absolutely correct. See, it is the blood of Christ that cleanses our sins. There's not a person in the room that can deny that. You know, we, we sing that old song, that oldie but goodie. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's a good song because the writer is absolutely correct. Notice with me, if you will, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, as John is beginning to give this revelation of Jesus to the churches in Asia. Notice that he says in verse 5, very quickly, he says, From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to Him who loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood, he cleanses our sins with His blood. And it's important for us to know that. That His blood is that powerful. Now did you notice that word from in Revelation 1.5? He washed us from our sins. Now that word from, whether you've ever thought about it or not, is a word that indicates separation. And really what John is talking about, or Jesus through John here, is the fact that Jesus separated us from our sins with His blood. We're to be separate and apart from that sin, you see. We used to be living in it and serving that sin, but now we are separate from it. Washed or cleansed from it. That's the separation we should be, we should be looking for, isn't it? You know, there's a lot of separation that takes place in our lives. We're familiar with the separation of ourselves from our loved ones sometimes when they pass from this life. But this is a good separation here. Notice how the psalmist puts this in Psalm 103, verse 12. I love Psalm 103, 12. For the psalmist here says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. Now stop and ask yourself a question. How far is the east from the west? I don't care how far you go, if you get on I-40 out here and go west, west, <laughs> you get on I-40 and you start traveling west, I don't care how far you go, there's always going to be more west. And there's always going to be more east behind you. And so the idea behind Psalm 103.12 is that when Jesus cleanses our sins from with, with His blood, rather, when He does that, it is an infinite removal. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far He removes your transgressions from you. And so, no matter how far you go, there will always be more east or more west. So He's washed us from our sins in His own blood. That washing, I want you to notice, doesn't occur anywhere outside the blood of Christ. Now, in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, as we're learning about the birth of Jesus... I want you to notice something peculiar that's said here. They're talking about what the, what the child's name is going to be and, and the event that's shortly to come. And in verse 21 of Matthew 1, we read this. She will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That ties in quite nicely with what we're talking about. Because we're talking about how he does that. He saves us from our sins in His own blood. Now notice on the screen, Jesus doesn't save people in their sins. That's a mistaken concept the religious world had. Jesus doesn't cleanse people or save people in their sins. Rather, what He does is He saves them from their sins in His blood. You see the difference? That's why Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 has read and always will read, he that believeth, or, or repent and be baptized, excuse me. That's why Mark 16, 16 says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And it will always say that. See, when a person desires to be baptized, he must turn away from these sins that we're talking about. He can't be baptized scripturally and be still living in his sin. It doesn't work that way. Because Jesus doesn't save you in your sin. Now in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 12, we have something uh, else interesting here said. It says, Therefore Jesus also, 
that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Read it again. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Now I want you to notice something about that word sanctify. That word there, rendered sanctify, is the verb form of the word holiness or holy. Okay? And so literally, if we're going to translate that word sanctify, you've always heard that it means to set apart, and that's true and accurate. But literally, that word means to make holy. So read that verse again and read it that way. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might make holy the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Now that word there, translated sanctify, is a synonym of the word wash in Revelation 1.5 that we looked at. It's a synonym of the word cleanse in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 that is the basis for this lesson. Sanctify, to make holy. See, Jesus suffered in Golgotha. Outside the, gate, outside the city of Jerusalem, He suffered in Golgotha to make people holy with that blood that was being shed. Sanctify, to make holy. See, it's the blood of Christ and nothing more that is effective to take away my sins. I get myself into such a mess sometimes that not even I could get it out of it. And that's why I've got to have something else, Jesus and His blood. Now you say, well, preacher, I know everything you've said thus far. And it sounds like a completed sermon almost, doesn't it? And I probably could quit, but if I did, let me tell you, I wouldn't be telling you the whole truth. Did you realize that? If I were to stop right here, I would not be telling you the whole story. Because, you see, my friends, the Word of God cleanses our sins just as the blood of Christ does. Say, whoa, wait a minute, preacher. I never heard anybody say that before. How does the Word of God cleanse our sins? Well, I want you to notice a verse that we often use, John 17, 17. Jesus here, of course, praying to His Father, and He says, Father, I want you to sanctify them by Your truth. Your Word is truth. You remember that word, sanctify? To make holy? Make holy them by Your truth. Your Word is truth. Father, would you please make them holy with your word? The word of God cleanses us. Yes, the blood sanctifies us. Yes, the blood makes us holy. Yes, the blood washes and cleanses us. And so you say, well, how is it that the word of God cleanses us then? How is it? How does the word of God sanctify us? Why did Jesus say that to his father in that prayer? Look at John chapter 15 and verse 3. Here Jesus says, You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. You're already clean because of this word that I've spoken to you. You see, there's a sense in which the word of God cleanses your sins. And that's what we want to find out how. Now in Psalm 119 and verse 9, the psalmist there says this, How can a young man cleanse his way? Then he answers the question, by taking heed according to your word. If you want your way to be cleansed, you've got to have the word. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. What relationship then does the blood of Christ have to the word of God? How can the Bible say that the blood of Christ cleanses our sins, Revelation 1.5, but then Jesus prays that the word, God's word, the truth, will cleanse us as well? That's in at least two ways. Perhaps more, but we're going to look at two ways. Number one, the Word of God directs us to Jesus. You stop and ask yourself the question, if it were possible for you to imagine a life or to pretend that you had never ever heard anything about the Bible, and I come up to you and ask you a question, who's Jesus? Now, if you could pretend that you didn't know anything about the Bible and somebody comes and asks you about Jesus, you couldn't answer that question. Because it's the Word of God that reveals to us who Jesus is. 
If we didn't know anything about the Word, we wouldn't know anything about Jesus. You see, the saving power of the blood of Jesus washes away our sins technically. Yes, that is true. But the Word of God is what tells us about it. You see that? If we didn't have the Word, we wouldn't know about Jesus and we wouldn't know about His blood. And so in that sense, the Word of God cleanses us. To find the source of the cleansing blood of Christ, you have to have God's Word. That's how He reveals it to us. But secondly, the Word of God directs us away from sin. The Word of God directs us to Jesus, but it directs us away from sin. See, the blood of Jesus is the remedy for our past sins. But the Word of God is the preventative against future sins. That's how it works. You know, your doctor may prescribe a medication for you that is preventative in nature. Well, the Word of God prevents us from going into more sin. Did you notice when we read Psalm 119 verse 9, the psalmist didn't say, how can a young man cleanse his sin? Do you remember what he said? How can a young man cleanse his way? How can you cleanse your way? That's what the Word of God does. It cleanses our way by directing us away from sin. It's simply not enough then to have our past sins forgiven. I need a remedy or, or I need a preventative measure for my future sins to keep me away from those things. And that's why two verses later the psalmist would say in Psalm 119 and verse 9 or 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. That word of God is the preventative measure. Now if I were you, I would take out a pencil or a pen right now and write down what I'm about to tell you. If you don't have it, come see me later. I'll tell you again. Listen carefully. This book will keep you from sin. But sin will keep you from this book. Now several people are attributed to that quote and I don't know who said it so I'm not going to tell you. It didn't originate with me though. This book will keep you from your sin, but your sins will keep you from this book. And you ought to have that written down in the front of your Bible, and you ought to read it every day. Because it's the truth. The Word cleanses our sins. So if you have a lack of desire for God, if you have a lack of desire for, for getting into His book, that tells me that chances are you've got some sin somewhere in your life that's keeping you from the book. And you've got to cleanse that sin. James says in James chapter 1 and verse 21, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And James there hit the nail on the head. Before the word of God will be palatable to you, you have to get rid of your sin. And that's essentially what James said there in James 1.21. Before you can uh, enjoy studying this book, you've got to get rid of the cancer known as sin. Because sin will do nothing but keep you from it. You drop down to, to Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. And here we have a similar emphasis. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. See, the grace of God appeared. It has appeared to all men. Number one, it appeared at Golgotha, where Jesus Christ shed His blood. But secondly, every week as we come together to remember that sacrifice, it ought to remind you of the grace of God. It appears in at least those two ways. But that's not all. You keep reading, you find that that grace teaches you something. It teaches us that we should deny the ungodliness, deny the worldly lust, and rather live soberly, righteously, and godly. The gospel of Christ is a product of God's grace. That's how God's grace teaches us those things, through the Word. And so if I'm walking down the pathway of sin, the grace of God would veer me off of that path if I would let it. If, if, if I would just stop it and consider it, and if I would get in the book, this book will keep me from my sin. God's grace teaches me that. 
Sometimes we learn the hard way that if we stop the evil, but don't replace that evil with good, that eventually we go back off into the same thing. That's a hard lesson to learn. And most always when you do that, when you stop the evil, when you don't replace it with good, and then later on you go back into that evil, most always it's worse the second time. See, the Word of God fears us off of that path. It tells how to live after we fear it off that path. That's more important. He says you get off of that path of sin, but not only do you do that, then you live soberly, righteously, and godly. That's Titus 2, 11, and 12. As we return to 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1, I want you to notice a final point. Yes, the blood of Christ cleanses us. And hopefully you can see clearly that the Word of God cleanses us. But you see, there's an important phrase there in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Actually, two important phrases we're going to look at right now. Therefore, having these promises to love, let us cleanse ourselves. That's important. Cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. You see, this cleansing is to be done inwardly and outwardly. But why is flesh mentioned first there in 2 Corinthians 7 1? In light of Matthew 15, it's odd to me that flesh comes first. Turn very quickly to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, Jesus here has been in this dispute with the scribes and the Pharisees. And in Matthew chapter 15, the latter part of that chapter, beginning in verse 18, listen to this. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. What? Those things that come out of your mouth, they're really coming from your heart. Okay? And they defile a man. So it seems to me that when Paul is instructing the Corinthians here to cleanse themselves, he would have said to cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the Spirit in the flesh. Because if my outward deeds are a result of my heart, then wouldn't I want to get to the heart of the problem first and cleanse my heart, my spirit? Let's continue reading in Matthew 15. Verse 19, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. That's inward. Murders, outward. Adulteries, outward. Fornications, outward. Thefts, outward. False witness, outward. Blasphemies, outward. These are the things that defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands doesn't defile him. So why does he say flesh and spirit? Here's a problem, okay? The problem is this. Sometimes we cleanse the outside and the inside is still filthy. What do you mean, preacher? Sometimes people who have lived their lives steeped in, in, in blatant and outright immorality, they quit those things. They quit cheating, lying, stealing, drinking, doing drugs. They quit those things. But when we do this, we can be deceived into thinking that we're really Christians. But the whole time that we quit those things, we still harbor resentment. We harbor anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, hatred in our hearts. And yes, we appear to everyone else that we are really Christians, that we have cleansed ourselves, but the inside is still filthy. And Jesus would go on to describe that very scenario. Talking about certain people, he said they look like whited sepulchers, but inside they are full of dead men's bones. They look really clean and polished on the outside, but the inside is filthy. Cleanse ourselves of the flesh and the spirit. And so we come a long way sometimes. We quit those things. We, we appear to be doing better. And Paul says you've only come halfway. It is great that you quit those fleshly sins, but the bitterness, the hatred, the unforgiveness, the revenge, all of those things that you harbor in your heart, your spirit, He says you've got to get rid of them too. You have to cleanse yourself of those things. And if you read through Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, then back up and read Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, you see that picture very clearly. It says fornication, uncleanness, covetousness. Let it not even be named among you as fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, foolish talking, coarse jesting, which are not fitting, 
but rather giving of thanks. And then back up in chapter 4, he says there, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you. You've got to do both inward and outward. And so are you really going to hold that grudge? When Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, to cleanse yourself from the filthiness of the flesh and spirit, it's true that our, our sins do begin on the inside and work its way out. But we need to be reminded that just because we clean up the outside doesn't mean we are clean. You've got to get rid of all of that hatred, bitterness, wrath, envy, unforgiveness. Get rid of it. How? Look at James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. It says, Therefore submit to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So it begins by submitting to God. Making His will your will. Resisting is when you quit those things that you know you shouldn't be doing. But notice verse 8, if you will. Verse 8. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. See, he probes a little bit deeper there, just like Paul. Cleanse your hands, purify your hearts. Not always, but sometimes to clean up our sins, we've got to begin on the outside. And we do that so we can get to the inside. Sometimes our sins are so overt, so blatant, that that's the way it has to be. Now, somebody wisely stated one time, You'll never feel your way into acting better. But you can act your way into feeling better. Now you think long and hard about that. Sometimes people say things like, well, the feeling just isn't there. I just don't desire to do that. I, I don't have any desire to come and worship God. The feeling is not there. How do you deal with it? See, you got one of two options. You can sit there and tell yourself that the feeling isn't there and you can use it as an excuse and you can go to hell over it. You can't feel your way into acting better. The second option is you can use what God has given you called volition. Volition is a power of choice. Volition reasons and it says, you know what? Right now I don't really have the desire to do that. But I know that if I continue down this path, I'm going to be lost. You say, so I really don't have a desire to go to Bible class, but I know that's what's right and I am going to do it. I'm reasonable. I don't want to go to hell, so I'm going to do that. You make yourself do what's right. And if something that you're supposed to do doesn't come naturally, you have to make it. Make yourself do it for a while, then it comes naturally. You can never feel your way into acting better, but you can act your way into feeling better. Perhaps that's why Paul put flesh before the Spirit. Perhaps that's why James put hands before the heart. Because sometimes sin has numbed our spiritual desires. But thanks be to God that we still have rationale, that we still have reason and volition, that we can make ourselves do what we know is right. Let's close our Bibles and take our songbooks out. As you're doing that, let me quickly recap. We've talked about this cleansing. Perhaps you haven't seen the grand scheme of things, but there has been two parts to our lesson. We, number one, we looked at God's part. Did you notice that? The blood of Christ, the Word of God, that's His part. He provided those things. But we've also seen man's part. That is the most important part, or one of the most important parts of 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1. Cleanse ourselves. There is a part that you have. We cannot do certain things. We cannot think certain ways and be pleasing to God. And so as we close today, know that God offers His cleansing for you. He offers it for you. The blood will remedy your past sins. The Word of God will prevent you from going into more sin. So God has the cure, but you need it. Why not believe on Jesus Christ? Repent of your sins, confess His name, and be baptized today for that cleansing, the remission of sins. If you've done those things but you're not faithful, why not come today and be cleansed right now? Repent and confess your wrong. Let us pray with you and for you. And you can have a new start today, right now, as we stand together and sing.